Good morning. So I'm going to start with a prayer from uh, a book by Francis and Judith McNutt called Deliverance from Evil Spirits. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you have given us authority in your name to bind up evil forces that try to come against us. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your cross and your blood, we bind that power and any evil spirit and command them not to interfere with our lives in any way. We break any curses, hexes, spells sent against us and declare them null and void. We break the assignment of any evil spirit sent against us and we send them to you, Lord Jesus. You deal with them as you choose. Lord, we ask you to bless our enemies by sending your Holy Spirit to lead them to repentance and conversion. Furthermore, we bind all interaction and communication in the world of evil spirits and those that affect us. We ask you, protect our families and our loved ones with the covering of your shed blood. We place the full armor of God on ourselves and those we carry in our hearts. Give us the gift of faith to pray at all times, knowing that you love and protect us. You are our refuge, our fortress, our hiding place. We are safe in the shelter of your love. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. Please send your mighty holy angels, the great archangel Michael, to help us in this battle. We ask you that you guide us and share with us your Holy Spirit's power and compassion. In your name, Jesus, amen. So good morning again, church. Uh, We're continuing our series of three unexpected evangelists, and this week we're going to look at a passage that might be a little difficult. Um... It might be a little off-putting because we don't usually talk about the enemy very much. We don't usually talk about our enemy in depth and demons and that sort of thing because it makes us uncomfortable. We're going to look at a man who was possessed by a legion of demons today. But before we do, let's remember our two verses that we have here. And I've asked you to memorize them, and uh, I haven't done a very good job of that. Who has? I'm sure somebody has in here. So let's, let's uh, open up to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We talked about how that authority is transferred to us as well. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all men, of all men, of all humanity, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I have commanded you. And I, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then we have Luke 9, verses 1 and 2. He summoned the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all the demons. Gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. He sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And as you can see, delivering people from oppression and healing their infirmities is a, is a key part of our mandate as Christians. By dealing with deliverance ministry, that is setting people free from demonic oppression, it's something that may be outside of your paradigm, may be outside of your view of Christianity. If it is and you're uncomfortable, good. You're in a good place because there's a lot of people who are like that. I am. I was. But it's important. So I want to start with two verses from a song from Keith Green. If we could have that picture of Keith Green with his magnificent afro that he had back in the 70s. Um, He wrote a lot of amazing songs and his lyrics were really prophetic in a lot of ways. If you've ever heard the song Asleep in the Light, that is such a powerful prophetic word to the church about awakening 
and serving those that are in need. But he wrote this song called No One Believes in Me Anymore. And it's written from the perspective of Satan. And it's all about how Satan has this world in his hand, and because nobody believes in him, his job has become easier. So the first two verses go, oh, my job gets getting easier. As time keeps slipping away, I can imitate the brightest light and make it look just like day. I put some truth in every lie to tickle itching ears. You know, I'm drawing people just like flies because they like what they hear. I'm gaining power by the hour and they're falling by the score. You know, it's getting very simple now because no one believes in me anymore. Oh, heaven's just a steady state of mind. My book reads on your shelf. Have you heard that God is dead? I made that one up myself. They're dabbling with magic spells. They get their fortunes read. You know they heard the truth but turned away and followed me instead. I used to have to sneak around, but now they just open up their doors. No one is watching for my trick since no one believes in me anymore. We have an enemy. We call him Satan, or the Greek says the Satan, the accuser, the opposer, liar, the crafty snake, the angel of light, and there's many other names. The ancient Jews called him Baal Bazab, which means the Lord of the Flies. Um, whatever name he goes by, the devil. He's been ruling this world since Genesis 3 and the fall of humanity. And he harshly opposes the kingdom of God. He will oppose us in any efforts we make to increase the kingdom of God. He's chasing hard after our youth. He's spreading chaos, confusion about sexuality, gender, politics, anything else he can think of. And we do ourselves a great harm when we ignore this enemy. Now, I'm not talking about looking for a, a devil behind every bush, but we need to be very sensitive to the fact that there is an enemy who is coming against us. He's coming against this church because God is doing something in this church. So do you think it's going to go on nor, ignored by the enemy? Nope. He's going to come against us. And why is that? Wasn't our enemy defeated on the cross and the resurrection? Absolutely. But if you remember, going back to June 6, 1944, when the English and the Americans and the Canadians landed at the beach, and they gained a beachhead through a lot of sacrifice, through a lot of blood. Nazi Germany's defeat was assured on that day, but there was a lot of fighting left to be done. When Jesus died and he rose again, he ascended to heaven, sent his Holy Spirit to us. Satan's defeat was assured it was done, but there's still a lot of fighting left to do until Jesus comes back. The key is remembering who our enemy is. Our enemy, according to John 10.10, 10, wants to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal our kids. He wants to kill the unborn. He wants to destroy relationships and marriage. He wants to spread chaos and destruction and cause as many people as possible to live in despair, anxiety, and hopelessness. That's his goal. He's a defeated enemy but he's not going down without a fight. He will harass and torment anyone who gives him access. And this is an essential point of truth. As Christians, he has no access to us unless we let him. We can't be possessed by demons, but we certainly can be demonized. We can be harassed by demons when we open up the door or maybe the door is harshly pushed open for us. So how do we give them access? So in our Sunday school class today, we talked about four specific ways. And there's many different ways, but there's four specific categories that we have. And if we could have that slide of those four specific categories. Fear, hate, sexual sin, and the occult witchcraft. And this is from Ken Fish's uh, Orbis Ministries teaching on inner healing. But inner healing 
has a lot to do with deliverance as well. Fear, so worry, anxiety, unbelief, a need to control others, isolation, substance abuse, all of these are entryways for the enemy. Hate, bitterness, envy, gossip, slander, anger, self-hate, jealousy, unforgiveness. That's a big one. Sexual sin. Sexual sin committed by us, but also sexual sin that is committed against us. Molestation and rape can open the door for the enemy to wreak havoc on the lives of its victims. Occult and witchcraft. You may say to yourself, wow, I don't do that. I don't hang around with witches. Huh? Do you read your astrology? Have you been to a fortune teller? Tarot cards, seances, Ouija boards, any kind of New Age practice opens the door for the enemy to come in and harass you. So let me clarify one important part, point here, and I said it earlier. If you have participated in anything I just mentioned, that doesn't mean that you are automatically demon-possessed or demonized. In fact, demons, you know, they can't possess Christians, but they, Christians can be harassed. So you may have opened the door to something that you didn't know. So I state all this to set the scene for our second unexpected evangelist. So if you would please open your Bibles, analog or digital, to Mark chapter 5. So Jesus, through the Gospel of Mark at this point, has done a bunch of things. In chapter 1, he delivered a man from demons. Going along, Jesus also asked the disciples in chapter 4 to get into a boat and travel to the eastern, sea, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, where he was beforehand was in the northwestern area of Galilee, Capernaum, Bethsaida, that area. And he was going to the southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee, known as uh, the Gerasenes or the Decapolis. Along the way, on that journey, they encounter a demonic storm. And why do I call it a demonic storm? Because Mark uses the same word, epimato, which is translated as rebuke. This is the word that Jesus uses to get rid of the storm. This word is an important word, and Jesus commanded the wind and the rain to stop by rebuking the demonic storm, and he uses that same authority to cast out demons. Clearly, the enemy did not want Jesus and the twelve going where Jesus had every intention of going. But Jesus, he took care of that. This is precisely where Jesus went. The area they were traveling to is an interesting choice. It's on, the, like I said, the southeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and the Gerasenes and the Decapolis. These were all pagan, Greek, originally Greek cities that supplied the Romans with what they needed to be Roman. They were Gentile cities, many businesses. The whole area was considered unclean, even more unclean than Samaria by the Jews, even the Galileans thought this area was pretty nasty. Why? Because it was filled with idol temples, ritual sacrifice, all kinds of nasty stuff. The people were unclean. Their businesses were unclean. And like Samaria, even being in that area could be unclean. Now I'm showing you a picture here. This is Kersey. Now you can see off in the distance the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee used to be up to where those white tents are. If you see the white tents, that's actually a kibbutz there, a, a farm. And the Sea of Galilee used to be up here, and this is an area called Kersey. And I took this picture from the top of the mountain where supposedly this event took place. If we can go to the next picture, we can probably see that mountain from the bottom. It's not on there? Okay, that's okay. But you get an idea of this top going down. 
Mark chapter 5 brings us to the shore of the Gerasenes. There came, they came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and among the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. So we start with this man who is in torment. He's not be, been able to be bound with physical chains because he keeps breaking them with superhuman strength. But he's in torment and he's in bondage to the enemy. Continuing on. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt before him and he cried in a loud voice, What? Do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment, torment me. For he had told them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Jesus is in the business of setting bound people free. If you are bound by any of those doors that we talked about, it's Jesus' business to set you free. And he was going to set this man free. What is your name? He asked him. My name is Legion, he answered, because we are many. And he begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs that we may enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 pigs rushed down the steep bank. Remember that view. They rushed down that steep bank. And they drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported it in town and the countryside. And the people went down to see what happened. They came to Jesus and saw a man who had been demon-possessed, now set free, sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described it to them, what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs. Then they began to beg him, Jesus, leave the region. All right, let's go through this. The crew, Jesus and the Twelve, encounters a demonized man who is full of demons, chock full. Legion means 3,000 to 6,000. That's a lot. Jesus uses the same kind of language he used for the demonized man in chapter 1 that he used for the storm that they encountered coming over there to release this man from his bondage. He sent these demons into a herd of swine who then committed suicide. Now, What's interesting is the people's reaction. Think about last week, when the reaction of the people when they heard what the woman was saying. Now, she had an encounter with Jesus. The guys tending the flock of pigs, they really didn't encounter Jesus. They just saw these pigs all of a sudden go into the sea. Scary thing, right? Well, let's get into their worldview. In their worldview, you have many gods, whole bunch of gods. And you treat them transactionally. Transactionally. So you say, God, whatever you are, Zeus, that was a popular one. Zeus took uh, offerings of pigs. That was one of the reasons why there were so many pigs there, is that they made Zeus offerings. Zeus, I'm going to offer you a pig so that you will do this for me, this for that. Very transactional. So here's this whole herd of pigs because Romans also like their barbecue and they like their bacon and their, their barbecue ribs. It's true. Jews don't. But the Romans, they were big on that. All of a sudden, a whole 2,000 go into the sea, destroyed. In their mind, in their transactional mind, a god must have shown up, been very displeased with them, and then destroyed their way of living. 
So they're, before this God, who they are thinking is Jesus, could do any more harm, they're begging him, leave, leave us alone. We'll try and do better. But that's not what Jesus is all about. And you may be asking to yourself, what does all this have to do with evangelism? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because this brings me to the text I have in mind, starting at verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. And Jesus did not let him. But he told him, go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went out and began to, began, to, began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and they were all amazed. This is the word of God for the people of God. So the man had an incredible, extraordinary encounter with Jesus, and Jesus set him up to go out and talk about that. He was an unexpected evangelist. Who would expect a man living in tombs, dirty, decayed, crazy by any standard, filled with up to 6,000 demons to go out and say, I met Jesus. He changed my life. It reminds me of a, of a woman that I know. Her name is Bernice. Bernice and her husband were missionaries many, many years in Brazil. And um, not only were they missionaries, they went into the prisons of Brazil to minister there. They went into the heart of darkness. And I asked Bernice when she returned back and her husband passed away. I asked, weren't you scared going into those prisons? She goes, why would I be scared? I had the Holy Spirit with me. I had Jesus with me, the whole white. Why, why should I be scared? Oh my goodness, what a conviction. I had Jesus, why would I be scared of that? So what did she do after her husband passed and uh, she kind of retired? She does prison ministry at Kershaw Prison. She's an amazing woman but it shows you the power that Jesus has. I'm not scared. I had an encounter with Jesus. He transformed my life. The man wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus had a different mission for him. This man was to sow the seed for future evangelism in the Decapolis. In Acts chapter 8, a great persecution starts in Jerusalem and all the believers, except for the apostles, flee. They go out because they know they're going to be persecuted in Jerusalem. But they go out not just to escape, but to bring the gospel. You have to imagine that many of them went to the Decapolis and found a waiting group of people who had heard from a man who was transformed by an encounter of Jesus and eagerly expected more from this man called Jesus. So what can we take from this story? First, through Jesus, anyone can be saved, no matter the evil that they've done or have been done to them. This man was genuinely engulfed with tremendous evil. Who knows what he did or had done to him to get him associated with three to 6,000 demons. But Jesus delivered this man, and he became a follower. Over second, Jesus had another plan in mind for him. Instead of continuing to Judea and the rest of his ministry, this man was sent home. He was sent back. Sometimes God calls us to a ministry that we were not expecting, and we have to have our eyes, hearts, and ears open for that, for what God calls us to do. Now, third, the text also states, 
he also went into the other ten towns of the region, and he would, and how would the gospel writer know this? My guess is that the evangelist from Acts 8 reported to Peter, who was Mark's source for the gospel, that the delivered man's missionary activities bore fruit. As Christ followers, our encounters with Jesus has to compel us to talk about him and offer him to a sick and dying world. The man who was delivered from a simple message, the gospel he preached was the love of Jesus. Folks, it's that simple. Being an evangelist means telling people about the love of Jesus and then letting Jesus do the rest. It doesn't matter to Jesus that this man had a dark past. What mattered to him was that the man was delivered and healed and obedient to go back and talk about it. God may not call us to the ministry that we're expecting. However, he calls us to the ministry he has prepared and equipped us for. Deliverance ministry is an essential part of Jesus' commission in Luke 9. We need to be open to the reality that we have an enemy that's torturing people. And they need freedom. Freedom from demonic oppression can only come from the power of the name of Jesus and the power of his indwelling Holy Spirit. But here's the point. What the delivered man teaches us is that if we act obediently, leaving the results to God, we genuinely, genuinely live out his mission. So as the worship team comes back, and I give you your homework assignment for this week, Continue to memorize, as I will as well, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Luke 9, 1 through 2. Remember, this is your mandate. This is my mandate. On that three-by-five card that you started last week, write down any open doors that may have been in your life. What do you need shut? Pray over those open doors and ask God, how to close them and be open to anyone this is the fourth action item for this week be open to anyone coming your way no matter who they are no matter what they look like no matter what they smell like sometimes be open to share the gospel the love of God the love of Jesus with them Amen